Good afternoon, kittens. How are you all doing today? Today is Tuesday, October 9th. Yes, October 9th, 2018. And this is not, not a podcast. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh God. Good afternoon, kittens. How are you all doing today? Today is Tuesday, October 9th, 2018, and this is episode four of the Knit Cute Podcast. I am your host, Amanda. You can find me as Wit on Ravelry and as So Nitpicky on Instagram. And I blog over at knitcute.com where you can find hopefully show notes. I haven't gotten to doing show notes yet again, everybody. I've been a little bit too um, busy and a little bit I don't know, I've been having problems getting back into the routine of doing show notes, but if you have any questions about anything you see in my recording, you can always feel free to ask me and I will answer that as quickly as I can. Uh, yeah, and I got a little off there. We have a Nick Cute Ravelry group, as well as I am the Dyer for Lammy Toes, which is lammytoes.bigcartel.com, I do believe. So anyway, how have you all been? I know it's been about a month since the last time I recorded, and I apologize for that. It's been a combination of not having enough projects, uh, too much going on, and right now I feel like I have swarms of angry bees buzzing in my brain all the time, and sometimes I just can't bring myself to be pleasant in podcasty. So I try to record mostly when I'm in a better mood and I'm, I have the energy to be pleasant, and I have not had that a lot of days. And then when I have had those kinds of days where I'm ready, it's been raining here a lot and very overcast and very gloomy. Uh, we are like that again today, by the way, but the light is a little bit better than it had been. It's not super dark overcast, so it's not giving that weird blue light that super gloomy overcast days give. So we're going to give recording today a try. Um, this, and I should have told you, Knit Cute is a mostly knitting related podcast, but you will see spinning, um, cross stitch, sewing, lots of other crafts here. It's a crafty podcast where I also sometimes plug my own business and other times I talk about things that are going on in my life that I think you also might want to hear about, whether they are personal or uh, media recommendations, etc. Mostly it's, it's a crafting podcast though. So today I have quite a few finished objects for you guys. One current work in progress, some cross stitch and a little bit of a Lammy shop update which will be happening tomorrow and I'll talk about that towards the end of the podcast. I'm not sure if I'll talk about life stuff or not, we'll see. Um, I feel very raw <laughs> right now and I'm not sure I wanna talk too much about life things because I, while I try to be as open as I can on the podcast, I don't always wanna talk about all of my inner workings and you know, just exposing stuff. And I think that's understandable. All of us keep a certain amount of our private lives private. So today we will start off with my largest finished object, which is a little boxy sweater. The pattern is by Hohi Locatelli, and you can find it on Ravelry for $6.50. Uh, this is the child's version, the smaller version of the boxy sweater, which I would imagine that if you're watching a knitting podcast, you are well familiar with the infamous boxy sweater, and it's in much smaller sizes for children starting, I think, from ages 2 up to 12, I do believe. Um, I knit a size 8, which is a, if, if uh, knit on gauge, is approximately a 47-inch circumference sweater. It is big enough that it could actually fit me as a fairly close-fitting but not too close-fitting sweater. Um, and I knit this on US size four and three needles in different Lammy Toes yarns combined with Hedgehog Fibers yarns. Most of these were leftovers from when I did my Hedgehog Fibers po uh, square poncho, which I can't remember if, no, I don't think I ever talked about it on the podcast. I knit it earlier in the year when I was on hiatus, uh, but you could find photos of it over on my Ravelry projects pages. Or if you followed me on Instagram, you saw it at that time. Um, if you ever want to look at my Instagram, it's at so nitpicky, one word, and you would be able to find me because I'm not a hidden account. So anyway, this took me a little over three weeks to knit, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. This was a project that did not go as planned because I did not time things out correctly. I have issues with time management, but let's see. So I knit this for my daughter. I can put that down and right now I have it rolled up in a nice neat little roll and you can see 
the combinations of colors that I used here. Uh, if you aren't familiar with Boxy, Boxy is a very large rectangular sweater with much smaller arms that start around the, um, the elbow and go down usually just a few inches to give a tiny bit of a sleeve. So I just finished weaving in the ends on this for the second time last night. <laughs> and here it is. It, this is for my daughter. She just turned 10 at the end of September. I'm also going to insert some pictures here, so I'm not going to hold this up too much because the pictures look much nicer. Um, so she just turned 10 on the 26th of last month, and I got it in my head that it would be nice to give her a trial run with a knitted garment again. Now, I believe that I've talked on the podcast before that my daughter does not have the best history of wearing hand knits that I make her. And this started back when she was a tiny little thing. Uh, I knit her a couple things like a whirly gig shawl. I knit her a couple other cardigans out of lighter weight yarns like cotton fleece. And she never liked wearing anything I made for her. Um, the one picture I have of her in a little sister dress, which I believe is a free uh, download on Ravelry, um, in a Christmas photo, she was screaming in it. Um, she doesn't tend to like anything that I make for her, but she always wants to steal my knits that I make for myself. And she tried to steal my boxy sweater, which I believe I did show you guys in maybe the first episode of the podcast or the second one here since I've rebooted. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to give this a try. I'm going to knit her a little boxy. I'm going to make sure that it's big enough that, you know, she can wear it for a while. And if she wears this one, I will consider knitting her more sweaters in the future because I do have some I would like to knit for her, including a color work, uh, color work yoked cardigan that has wolves on it. Like one of her favorite things in the world is wolves and werewolves. She just has this thing for them. And I thought it would be a perfect project for her, but I do not want to sink in the time and the effort to do that if she's not going to wear hand knits that I make for her. So this is her trial garment. And if she wears it, what I consider a sufficient amount, I will then look at making her something else. So anyway, I started this about 15 days before her birthday. I didn't get started as early as I would have liked. And when I was knitting it, I did not carve out enough of each day to work on it. At that point in time, I was busy with something else and very distracted, and I was getting maybe an hour's worth of work on it a day, so I wasn't getting much because I knit this one flat so that it was easier to alternate the colors when I went between the different partial skeins of yarn. Uh, so anyway, I had to rush. I managed to finish it two days before her birthday, but the entire time, especially once I got to the top, this little nagging voice in me, and I think all of us as crafters have this little nagging voice, started telling me that something was not right with how I knit this pattern. So I finished the sweater because I didn't want to listen to it. I wanted to make my deadline. And when she tried it on, when she opened it, it was way too short. The sleeves or the shoulders weren't fitting right. And the sleeves were way too tight. And I thought this is kind of odd. So I sat on it for about a week and I realized that what I needed to do if I really wanted her to wear it was to rip it all the way back to where the underarms started the first time and re-go from there. Now when I was re-knitting this, I also still did not look at the directions very closely. I'm somebody who, um, I tend to skim pattern directions, especially if the pattern is super straightforward like the boxy is. Not giving away the secret sauce, a boxy top like this is basically two rectangles seamed together with shoulder shoulder shaping and sleeves added on, you know, knit straight off part of the box, the rectangles. So I didn't think I needed to look at the directions that closely. And uh, I then started adding several more inches, which was a good choice, by the way. It ended up being a really good length for her and she can grow into it. But I didn't look at the pattern directions until I got up to closer to where I thought the pattern, uh, the textured ridging here was going to be for the top of the sweater. And then I realized that the reason why the sweater didn't fit the first time is that I skipped not one, but two sets of important directions because my brain either completely ignored them or it read things differently than how they are. And this has made me question my competency and my reading level. Um, it, it's embarrassing as somebody who, when she was 10, tested as having a college level comprehension reading ability. <laughs> oh boy, that has changed as I've grown older. I'm actually just very distracted right now. I think a lot of us are. But I misread two sets of directions. So finally, I corrected that. But in the process, it added 
And I should add before I go on anymore that the yardage total I got the first time I finished was about 300 yards less than the pattern called for for yarn, which should have also been a huge red flag to me. But again, I wanted to make that deadline so badly that I just, I ignored it. And I thought, oh, well, even if it's a little bit small, as long as she can wear it for the winter and maybe the spring, I'm not re-knitting this thing. I almost never rip anything out and re-knit it. <sighs> I changed my mind and I redid it and after eight additional days of sinking in about three hours a day knitting on this sweater it's done it is an additional 350 yards of fingering weight yarn so almost an entire additional skein of yarn and uh, it's it finally fits her properly like I said I'm gonna put in some photos if I haven't already maybe I'll stick them in here and if they're not here they were probably earlier So that you can see them and also if you follow me on instagram i posted these up this morning and if you're my friend on ravelry i updated my project page already with the photos of the newly finished sweater on her but it fits her great now and uh yeah so i'm really happy now with how it came out that i actually knit it to specs if you're wondering what i skipped uh after you get to the point where you want to start the armhole uh you are supposed to then knit a certain height and then you start the ridges and I had skipped that additional height so there was the several inches too short that it was for sure the first time and then when I read the directions the first time I didn't put in enough shoulder ridges because I read one of the shaping directions instead of size 4 to through size 12 4 to 12 I read it as sizes 4 and size 12 so I skipped an entire section like this of the shoulder shaping. So the shoulders on the first one were very flat. It sat really funny and uh, it was not good all the way around. So I'll talk really quick. Um, like I mentioned, there are two different yarns in here mostly. These are remnants of Hedgehog Fibers colorways and a couple of my own. So this first one is an experimental from my own shop that I kept I think the first year I was dying. I had never used it. This is an MCN blend. This is my Poppet MCN base and I never gave it a name but it was kind of a mushroomy color with hot pink and uh Actually it's lemon, <laughs> fluorescent lemon but it looks kind of chartreusey and a little bit of, uh, I can't remember if that's a black or a dark gray speckle, but it looks black. And then I went into a partial skein of Hedgehog Fibers and I think the Flower Child colorway, it was one of the club colors. And I really loved it. And you can see a lot of yellow flashing in here, uh, which is why I put these two by each other. But anyway, um, I had bought it on a D stash, not realizing that the skein I was purchasing was actually a lot more pink and a lot more yellow than some of the other ones were. There are some skeins out there that have a lot more of this purple in them, which is what I had been hoping for and didn't get that, but it works out great in this garment. So I think I have only like a gram or two of that left over. I then went into a tiny ball of Hedgehog Fibers Crybaby, uh, then Hedgehog Fibers Zephyr, and then I blended into a skein of Lamy Toes. Uh, this is the Moon Pie Merino base, my 7525. And this is Care Bear Explosion, but this skein turned out really kind of pastel and didn't have a lot of color in it. And you can see it better on the back because I used more of it on the back. But so I decided to hold on to it for myself and I've been using it in different projects. And uh, so I did that. And then for the sleeves, I had to pull out another skein and I pulled out Hedgehog Fibers sock in the teacup colorway I think that is which is white with just little flecks of brown and pink and then the brown dye breaks once in a while to give you orange and blue speckles so all in all I am much much happier with this now like I said it's wide enough it could actually almost fit me <laughs> if the sleeves are bigger and uh, I think she's actually going to wear this one so that makes me quite a bit happier and I'm so happy to have this off the needles because now I have the time to work on something else so the next thing I finished is block number eight of my 10 stitch blanket. And that is a free pattern from Frankie Brown and it's based off of an Elizabeth Zimmerman pattern. Uh, the last time I showed this to you guys, I had been, I think I was almost done with the final square. I think I had talked about this green round and I was just starting on this uh, mustache yarn section. Well, I have since then finished the mustache yarns 
which looks gorgeous. And then I had started on the outside, which this is Knit Picks Stroll Glimmer Sock. It's or it's Glimmer Stroll. It's the Stroll base, but with a little bit of sparkles. And I don't think you, they're really coming up on camera. They're really subtle anyway. And this is the Kestrel colorway, which is a very warm, slightly brown, dark gray, which is right in my wheelhouse. Do you see that? Gray browns love me. <laughs> and I kind of love them, uh, darker shades of squirrel. So that is what I have for block number eight. So that is finished and I did start the next block and I will show it to you when I get to the works in progress section. My final finished object, I actually need to reblock because I did not aggressively block it the first time and I kind of just hung it over the back of a chair and it didn't quite do the trick, is my Canyonland shawl. This is a $5 pattern on Ravelry by Nim Teasdale. I don't remember how this is supposed to be held. And you have all been watching me knit this out of two different skeins of hand spun from 2014 and 2015. And I finally finished it. Uh, it would be, I think, too small for me to wear as a shawl, but I decided to do this for my daughter. And you can see how pretty this is. The last time you all saw this, I think we were somewhere in here. So I have since added in more of the Into the World skein that I showed you and you can go back to previous episodes to see me talk about those more in length. I completely finished off the Spun Right Round and I think I had I had to do part of the bind off here. I had to re-add in the Into the World because I ran out of yarn. Even though the pattern as called for says to save about 10% of your hand spun for doing this graduated bind off but in reality I saved just over 10%. I saved about 12% I think and I ran out well before the bind off was over so just so you know if you're doing this pattern you might want to conserve a bigger chunk than that of your yarn <sighs> and yeah so it's done I'm trying to see if you can see a little bit better here how I mean this thing is super deep um, if I were to knit this again, I think I would start from the get-go doing more rounds in between the increase rows because I think it it uh, it got too big too fast. I would have liked a more graduated arc and increasing. And also it just it's kind of to me it's kind of an odd shape. But I mean like if I wanted to, yeah, it's just barely long enough that if I clipped it, I could probably wear this myself. I could definitely wear this just over my shoulders in this kind of a style of shawl. But for myself, I would have needed, I think, another 12 to 18 inches of horizontal length to really wear it comfortably. But you can see, like, I can wear this pretty comfortably if I wanted to. Uh, but this will fit my daughter, who is quite a bit smaller than myself, and I think she'll be able to wrap it. And uh, that's who it's going to go to. So I may reblock these ends because with the graduated bind off, in some spots where the weight on the shawl was heavier, it smoothed out the curve. It looks very smooth. But in the spots where there wasn't as much weight, you can see the little jaggedy edges. Actually, it doesn't look as bad on camera. There you go. That's kind of more indicative there. Um, you can see the jaggedy little edges where the graduated bind off happened, but if they pull straight, they look flat. So I'm probably going to try to fix that before she wears it. I haven't decided if I'm just going to pin it out and spray it, if I'm going to try to be brave and steam block it a little bit. Probably not. I've never had good um, <laughs> experiences with hand spun and steam, uh, but I want it to look just a little bit smoother. So that is finished and completely out of stash. And I cannot remember what size needle I used. I think I might have used a US size six. And this was, again, as I said, two older skeins of hand spun that I thought would play nicely together. And overall, I think that they did. And just for fun, let's see this one as a, a rolled up project too. I think, yeah, I think those two colorways went really nicely together at the end of the day, even though Maybe this orange doesn't make me the happiest in there, but it works. So that leads us to our works in progress. Um, to start off, I'm going to talk about my next square of my 10 stitch blanket, which I actually reused two of the yarns from the previous square to bring in a little bit more pastel -y goodness. But I reused that Kestrel from Knit Picks in the center, and I used a little bit more of this um, mustache yarns and the apple, apple, lavender apple blossom colorway. Uh, just because I had a very tiny ball left and even when I was done with this there's a, a few yards of that one partial skein left but I almost managed to use it up 
And I'm really happy with that so far. And I'm using a last little remnant of, I believe this is Plucky Sock in the Holland Lavender colorway. I used this in a shawl and I've used it for a couple other things, but it's a very light lavender color that's really pretty. And with how much I have left, I know for sure I'll get the third side done, but I think I'm gonna run out of yarn somewhere here-ish. And I'm gonna have to stick in something else to finish it up. I'm thinking I might just go with the cream this time and keep things easy on myself. So that is a good start on block nine. And once I'm done with that, I'm actually gonna be able to figure out what I want the layout of my blocks to be. And I'm going to start adding sashing in between these because I'm going to be doing basically a knitted quilt rather than just a blanket that I'm gonna to seam together. And the way I plan to do that is that I'm going to pick up stitches on each side. I'm not sure if I'm gonna do 10 stitches, like the regular width of the rest of the blanket, or if I'm gonna go with something with just slightly wider, like 12 stitches to differentiate the sashing from the blocks just a little bit more. And then once all of those are put together, I'm planning to do, I think, the shorter vertical columns between the pieces of the rows, and then I'm gonna do longer horizontal columns to piece together the, the rows into create columns, I guess. I don't know, I guess I'm going by rows rather than columns on this one. Uh, and then when that's all done, I'm going to then go around the entire outside with an equal width border, and then I might continue to go from there and do an I-cord bind off all the way around it. So I still have a long way to go on this project. I am nowhere near finished. I'm hoping to finish square nine this month. And then I'm hoping to next month get the layout figured out, do all the little short vertical sashings, and then I'm hoping to, in December, be able to do the horizontal ones and start working on the outer border. I do not realistically see myself finishing this blanket this year unless I decide to dedicate more time to it, and I kind of have other things that I would like to work on too, like some sweaters. Um, but I'm hoping it'll be finished sometime in January or February of next year, which is not that far away actually so I it's well within reach and I'm looking forward to finishing it and my last knitting work in progress is when you've already seen you saw the partially finished object the last time I recorded which these are my sixth pair out of eight that I hope to knit this year of socks for my for my I guess not totally for myself because I did knit a pair for my husband but every year I make a goal of how many pairs of socks I want to knit and I try to meet it. And this year it was eight because eight seems to be a pretty good number for me because I don't knit quite a pair of socks every month, but about every six to eight weeks I can finish a pair pretty easily. And I started on the second sock, which I didn't start until just a few days ago uh, because I was working on that sweater more than anything else. But I took time when I was sitting at my computer, either watching podcasts or reading articles to pull these out and start ripping through or whipping through them. Uh, I have one more, this one more lavender stripe. I have one more of the colors in here and then a partial lavender stripe before the heel goes in. And then because they're anklets, once the heel goes in, the leg and cuff are gonna take no time at all. We can get a little closer there too so you can see all those pretty colors. I really love this colorway and I will have a good size portion of this skein left when I'm done. These are the yarns that Stacy dies up that have two perfectly matching skeins so that you can, you know, start at the exact same point on both and theoretically your socks should be exactly identical. And the other ball, the, por the partials I had left over, I used in my blanket. And now there's just a teeny tiny little piece left of that one and it's pretty much used up. So yeah, and that's what it looks like in the, the cake. It's just so pretty. So anyway, that is my other knitting work in progress. I am knitting these on US size one needles, I think 2.25s, I think is what I'm using on this one. Let's see. I got my cord, I'm looking, 24 inch, US size one. No, these are 2.5s, a slightly bigger US size one. Okay, so we are through the knitting portion of the podcast. I wanna talk about my cross stitch project real quick, and then we will move into other topics like the shop update and one thing that I got recently that I wanna talk about. So right now I have switched gears and I am focusing a lot more on a project for Christmas for my new nephew. I did not get my sister-in-law and my brother-in-law a baby gift because I did not know what to get them. Couldn't go to the baby shower, did not know what everyone else had gotten them, and I wanted to give them something that's a little bit more meaningful than just more bibs or burp cloths or anything else. And I want to knit my nephew sweaters, but my mother-in-law is also a knitter, and I have a feeling she's probably already covered that. I kind of need 
to find out <laughs> on the sly if my mother-in-law knit him many sweaters and if she did what she knit him so that I can make him something completely different. Um, I feel it's important to not make the exact same things uh, someone else is making for him. Anyway, so I'm working on a cross stitch sampler, which is this year's stitch along from the Frosted Pumpkin Stitchery. This is Into the Jungle. I think it's an 1895 pattern, which is really good for the size of the pattern. And if you had stitched along all year, getting something to do every month. And the last time you guys saw this, I had stitched in the first block, which is the sloth. And I had stitched in two thirds of the toucans. So you had seen those two guys. And I had started doing the frame around the frog, but I had not finished. So since I last talked to you, in September, I stitched in that third toucan and he's all done. I finished the frog's frame and I stitched in the entire frog, which he's a smaller block, so he was easy. And I stitched in the block or the frames for the next three blocks on top. And I stitched in and finished this cute little monkey. And then I took a break. Uh, now this month I have started stitching in the tiger, who is one of my favorites and one of the reasons why I got this sampler because tigers are my favorite and they are my children's favorites. So I'm trying to figure out where to hold this while we're talking. <laughs> Uh, and I've stitched in almost all of him. As you can see, I still have a little bit of his coat to do here in the back. And then there's a little bit of foliage and greenery up here and a tiny bit down here that I need to finish. So the goal for October is finish the tiger, finish the block that was just released this month, which is, I think it's golden macaw parrots. It's a type of parrot. I think it's golden macaws there. And then I'm going to stitch in the top border for sure. Um, I'm changing the pattern. The pattern as shown has, it says into the jungle up here and there it's a slightly thicker border and it has a bunch of uh, jungle foliage around it. And then the bottom is a thinner band of foliage at the bottom with no words, but it's a certain pattern. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a mirror, uh, for a flipped across the horizontal axis mirror image of the bottom foliage up top here so that there's no words and it's just a bunch of beautiful greens, different green leaves with brown stuff in here. And I think it'll look really nice. I'm doing that partially because I'm not the biggest fan of a lot of writing on my samplers. I don't particularly like that. And also because of my, my in-laws tastes, I don't know if they would go for cutesy writing on a sampler for their boy. Um, they have some kind of funny ideas about things uh, that might be seen as much more traditional, but I don't want to have it taken, uh, not put up on account of my brother-in-law might not see it as masculine enough. That's just a whole nother rant for a whole nother time. But I've decided that's what I'm going to do to make it as um, acceptable as possible. And I've been doing that in small chunks of time every night. I usually try to stitch at least one length of floss every night, which gets me anywhere from probably about 45 to 60 stitches, depending on what I'm stitching and you know how it's going and how long it was when I, I took the length of thread. And it's getting things done even if it's not the fastest. I was quite pleased that in September I was able to finish two full blocks plus a portion of another, plus do a bunch of outlining in that time and still knit as much as I did on my daughter's sweater and still get other things done. So I think that is absolutely amazing. So that ends the rest of the crafting content in the show. Uh, I did get one thing in the mail that I ordered and I thought I would show you guys. And in October, I'm hoping to, before I record again, do a little bit of garment sewing to be able to show you all. So when, I love 100 acts of sewing. Um, it, very simple patterns, very basic, easy to make, very good instructions. And if you are on Creative Bug, she has a bunch of her patterns up there with video tutorials, which are super helpful, by the way. Totally worth the $4.95 subscription price for the month. And uh, she just released a new pattern, which is shirt number two. Now shirt number two, unlike the rest of her patterns, well that's not true either because pants number two is also a knit pattern finally, uh, but shirt number two is, a, is designed for knit fabrics and it is a basic t-shirt pattern. I am super excited about this because like a lot of you, I have a hard time finding t-shirts that fit me. They are almost always too short because styles right now have been short again. And the fabric in a lot of 
shirts is super thin and super chintzy and it just it doesn't wear well and that can be super frustrating it's also frustrating to not be able to find basics like a t-shirt in colors or patterns that you want to wear so I have a ton of knit fabrics and I'm going to be trying out this pattern I don't know if I'll make it a full long sleeve pattern because I tend to either wear slightly longer short sleeves because I don't like shorter cap sleeves because of how my arms are shaped and it just makes them bunch up in there kind of oddly. But I don't like sleeves that go all the way down to my wrist because I'm the kind of person who usually pushes everything up to about here. So I think I'm going to be trying to knit, uh, make either some slightly sh longer short sleeve shirts and some that have an uh, arm that goes down to about here where I would not be tempted to push it up all the time and see how it goes. Uh, my fabric stash is huge and one of my goals between now and whenever we move next is to get my fabric stash reduced by enough that I can get rid of hopefully one of my larger totes and have everything condensed down into a smaller volume of space. Because I way overbought in the past thinking I was going to make a ton of garments and do a ton of things and I had such grand plans all the time but not always the ability to get through and do them. And yeah, so that's kind of like what my whole last couple of weeks has been like too since I talked to you guys. But I think I'm going to save that maybe for the next podcast and do some life chat. Well, I got to do it now, I suppose. So if you're wondering what I've been up to since I last talked to you guys a month ago, besides knitting like a fiend on a little boxy sweater, I have actually been doing a lot of culling in my own home again. Uh, we, I mentioned, I think in the past episode that we had just had it confirmed that we are definitely moving on the summer cycle this next coming year. And that could be anywhere from April to September. And we still don't know where we're going, but we could know as early as Thanksgiving, but it will probably be more like Christmas time, New Year's before the assignment comes out. Um, we have been here over six years at this point, about six and a quarter years, which is very unusual for a military situation. We should have moved from here like three times now. All of our neighbors have switched out at least twice since we got here, if not three or four times. It's very odd to be the only fixture in the neighborhood that doesn't change. Um, but due to circumstances I think I've talked about in previous episodes of not a podcast, my old podcast, uh, that story can be pieced together there. And if someone really wanted to know, I'd probably tell it. In a comment or on the forums if you really want to know but anyway for reasons we've been here for forever and by the time we go to PCS we will have been here about seven years give or take a couple months either way probably uh, so we are getting really excited to leave but in that six years so far we have accumulated a lot more stuff than we initially had when we moved in here a lot of it has been furniture like all of this furniture did not own it um, I'm sitting in my craft room right now and out of all the furniture that's in here my computer desk and a folding chair and a small sitting chair that the dogs have since ruined are the only things we brought in here I have two additional desks, two new sewing machines, this whole unit, another unit this size plus the attached desk, and a unit that's half this size in this room alone. Uh, my entire house has exploded with both furniture and belongings in six years. Uh, there's a reason why they say a a rolling stone gathers no moss. Uh, this stone has been stuck for a while and we are coated in moss at the moment because possessions tend to pile up, especially when you have kids and pets. Uh, so anyway, we have started more seriously going through our possessions uh, because regardless of where we move, we definitely do not want to come up against the higher weight limit. Uh, how the military works is that depending on your rank depends on how many pounds of household goods the government will uh, pay for for you to move. At my husband's current rank, we get a couple thousand pounds more than we did when we moved here. But again, furniture is really heavy. <laughs> Uh, so if we move in country, so if we stay in CONUS, which means in continental US, in CONUS, uh, we would get a couple thousand pounds more than we did when we left, which we probably would make that weight limit, especially because we're planning to get rid of a few larger things before we move from here. Uh, but if we end up going OCONUS, which could be Alaska, Hawaii, or any of the um, bases overseas that we would qualify for, which would be South Korea or Germany, um, when you go Oconus, they cut your weight limit in half. Uh, the reasoning being that you should just borrow from the government provided 
lending closets overseas. Um, and from what we have understood from researching from people who have done this before and done blogs and things about it, you do not want to be borrowing any of their couches and you do not want to be borrowing any of their mattresses. They are gross and really uncomfortable. So we have extremely heavy mattresses. My husband and I have a king size Tempur-Pedic foam mattress, which is several hundred pounds by itself. <laughs> but we were thinking about this and we realized that if that's the case, um, anything that would not be deemed necessary enough to bring with us, we would have to put into storage back here and then not see for two to three years. And if that's the case, there's a ton of stuff that we probably would not need to keep because why have it stored if we're not really going to need it? Um, we would not want to come back to the States, be completely overwhelmed looking at our things and going, wow, why did we keep this? And we decided that maybe it would just be easier and make more sense to start culling things now so that if that that worst case, well not worst case, but if that scenario pops up, uh, we do not have as many hard decisions to make in a shorter period of time. Might as well start now while it's more leisurely. So this is what we've been doing. I have been going through and culling like crazy my areas of the house because while I like to blame everybody else for this stuff, and it is true that my kids have a ton of things and my dogs have a lot of things and my husband has a lot of things, um, a lot of things that are in our living area are mine. Um, whether they are things for the kitchen and for eating and dining, I have a, a habit of collecting stuff, um, books, fabric, all of my craft supplies. My craft supplies take up a lot of space and a lot of weight because if you ever try to lift a big, huge Rubbermaid tote of fabric, it's like 70, 80 pounds. <laughs> they get heavy. Um, and I have several of those. But anyway, I have a ton of stuff that wouldn't necessarily be able to come with us in that situation and I wouldn't necessarily be excited to see again after two to three years of not seeing it. I would be like, oh, why did I keep this? Why didn't I get rid of this before we moved? Why did we just you know, we won't have to pay to store the stuff, but why did we have someone save it for us? Sorry, I just lost my train of thought because my daughter came in from outside and had to grab a bunch of things and then went back out. I think we were talking about if we end up moving and getting rid of my stuff. So what I've been doing is I've been going through my areas of the house quite thoroughly. And I found that I'm somebody who has to go through and cull three, four, five, six times with a couple week to a couple month break in between to look at my things with fresh eyes and it makes me more willing to get rid of more stuff at that time. I don't tend to be very good about getting rid of all of it all in one go. So um, I'm trying to remember, I think I started talking about it a little bit towards the end of my recordings of the previous podcast, but I've started clearing through the kitchen areas and being realistic about what things do I use? What cake pans do I use? What do I use all the time versus what are things that I bought because I think they're neat and I maybe use them twice and then I haven't touched them in years. So I've been making space in all my kitchen cabinets. I've been getting us down to what we need versus what I think we need. Um, and I've been going through my bookcases. Um, if you pay attention to all this space behind me with all these uh, notebooks, and, or not notebooks, these magazines and books and things, uh, you may notice that they have been slowly going down as I've been deciding that it's okay to let more and more things go. And in my dining area, which we're a uh, caution for all of you who might get sick. I don't know if you can see it today. Uh, that's my dining area where I have sewing stuff on my table, but you can see a bookcases back there. That was my big project in the last couple of weeks. I've actually managed to, after the third time going through those bookcases, get it to the point where everything that was shoved on top of the bookcases plus the contents of the bookcases plus the stuff shoved in front of the books. It was a mess. Um, all fits on the shelves in the bookcases, which is super exciting because I've been looking at it and feeling really good about it. Um, I have been coming to terms lately with Amanda's reality, and those are things Amanda actually, <laughs> talking about myself in the third person now, things I actually do, uh, things I actually use, and things that I am still actively interested in and I can see myself doing and not just I wish I was doing. And separating that from fantasy Amanda, who apparently has all the time in the world and she wants to do everything. Uh, so I've been getting rid of a lot of fantasy Amanda stuff lately and she had a ton of cooking magazines, which when I looked through them now, I could not remember even why I had bought these magazines in the first place. Uh, a bunch of cookbooks I'm never going to use, a bunch of craft and decorating books I'm never going to use, 
books that I had read at one point in time, thought I might read again and then never did. Um, I've been trying to remind myself that there's this thing called a library <laughs> that I could be using for the rare occasion I might actually want to read that book again. I know, have you heard about a library? They're, these are a thing apparently. Uh, so that's um, something I've been doing. I've been trying to get down to things I actually actively want to use and you know over time tastes change. I have been knitting for 11 years now and magazines and books and things that I bought back when I started in 2007 are not to my taste now. Again, shocking, right? The idea that your tastes change over time and you don't actually want to use or do those patterns anymore because knitting patterns have evolved quite a bit in the last decade. And a lot of those things are super easy to find elsewhere, sometimes for free, or again, library book loans if I decide that I want to knit something out of there. Uh, so I've been going through all of my stuff and doing this. I do also want to go through some of my fiber and my yarn. Um, but if you read my blog, you've probably been watching my stash down efforts and I've been doing really well on my yarn this year, largely because I finally, for the most part, stopped buying yarn and have actually been going through stuff that I need to use, including knitting that really big, beautiful poncho that I kind of turned into an open coat using all the hedgehog fibers, and that's a free pattern from hedgehog fibers, um, and doing lots of sweaters and different things and trying to use up my quantities. Now, if we are going to go overseas, I would like to take all my craft supplies with me, but I will probably do a huge de-stash if that's happening to get rid of things that I'm not going to use before we manage to move or that I, I can see myself realistically using in two to three years. So I might have a huge de-stash coming down the pipe. Um, on Instagram, I created a de-stash account, but I haven't loaded anything into it. And I probably would do the same thing with some of my fabrics. So if you're looking for some really old out of print fabrics, it's possible I have them. So anyway, uh, that's what I've been largely preoccupied with when my brain is not on fire and angrily buzzing about everything. Um, unfortunately, my head's been in a place where I've been thinking about something that happened to me 15 years ago and having to relive that over and over and over again and how apparently I'm not as over it as I thought I was at the time. It's not as serious as maybe my vagueness is making it sound, but it was serious enough and it was traumatic enough that it's been seared into my brain forever and current events in the US <laughs> and discussions about how women are treated especially. Now this conversation, yes, should be opened up to include non-binary people and men, but unfortunately um, a lot of times men report things that happen to them even less than women do and women as it is grossly under report. Um, but anyway, it should be a more inclusive conversation. And I think that that's a welcome thing. It's just that we're not getting as much participation necessarily. And maybe people don't feel safe to talk about it. But anyway, we're not going to go into this can of worms right now. Uh, the conversation is mostly focused on women and how women are treated by men. Um, and especially because it, it has to do with power and controlling others and women get treated very, very badly. And um, yeah, I just kind of lost where I'm going with this and I'm, <laughs> I don't want to start getting super emotional and crying on camera because no one wants to see my blotchy face. Um, but anyway, so I've been stuck in that uh, frame of mind, which is why I've been doing a lot of knitting and I've been very quiet on my social media and I'm not always recording now uh, because I have some days where I'm very angry <laughs> and I am crying a lot and I'm just so upset, not just for myself, but for everybody else I know who has had things to various degrees done to them um, from ages very young up until they were adults and how we still apparently as a country cannot have this conversation without trying to derail it and trying to make it something else. And uh, that is really depressing sometimes. So anyway. That's as far into that can of worms as I'm going today. Um, maybe we can talk about it later if people actually want to talk about this. Um, but for all of you out there, for whatever it's worth, I believe you. <laughs> and I think all of us have had something happen to us at some point. And I think it's a shame we can't talk about it more. So we're gonna leave that there. Let's do a shop update. If you have stuck with me this long, thank you for sticking through that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about my Lammy shop update, which will be tomorrow 
Wednesday, October 10th at 7 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. It's going to be bags because as I've been doing these things, um, I have not been in a place where I want to dye yarn. It's either been too hot and it's only recently gotten cooler and today it's hot again. It's almost 80 degrees and it's super humid. I don't know if you can tell that I'm kind of glowing a little bit here, but it's very humid and I don't want to turn on the AC for two days worth of warmer weather, but I might have to give in tonight. Uh, so I've been doing a little bit of sewing, listening to podcasts, which I can do a podcast or a recommendation there. Um, if you are interested in true crime, um, kind of horrific real life events, uh, this podcast was recommended to me by my friend Kate. It is called Dr. Death. Uh, you can find it, I think, on Apple Podcasts. You can find it. I was listening to it through Spotify. If you have Spotify downloaded as a player on your computer or your device, you can listen to it there. And it is talking about Dr. Christopher Dunch in Dallas, Texas, and the events that happened in 2012 and 2003 regarding him. He was a neurosurgeon who was jumping from hospital to hospital, performing surgeries, that he was not properly trained to do and he was not equipped to do. Um, he operated, I think, on 38 people. Five managed to get out of it with no complications. Two died, or three died, I think it was two. And all the rest were left maimed and like permanently paralyzed. It is quite a lot, uh, quite, quite a lot. That's my speech impediment coming out. Quite a ride. <laughs> I had speech therapy when I was four because I couldn't say ours. Quite a ride um, that it's something to listen to. Each of the episodes is 25 to 35 minutes in length. There are six main episodes. There's been one update episode so far, and I think there's an additional one scheduled for, oh, I think today, actually. So I might be listening to that. But it is horrifying, and you will probably literally shriek and yell out loud when you hear some of the things that you hear. I'm not gonna give it away, but I was live tweeting Kate as I was listening to this podcast and going all exclamation points. And I did actually shriek a couple times and my son was worried that I was hurt or something had happened to me. And then when I told him, he started shrieking too and going, how does that even happen? But it's it doesn't give you a lot of faith in the American medical system, unfortunately, but I think it's a good listen and something that all of us need to be aware of, especially if you or a loved one has to have a serious surgery in regards to surgeons. So anyway, <laughs> sorry, I got way off track there. I was going to talk about a shop update. So I've been doing a lot of sewing while listening to this podcast. So Lammy is having a bunch of bags put in, which I do my bags one at a time. So it's a slow process. I'm not a mass producer. And there's going to be a lot of the last batch of the Halloweeny fabrics. Um, there are two, sorry, I'm putting my leg up here so I can put these down, uh, two matching little ghosty bags. This is my my standard bag I make most of the time. I call it a small project bag. It's big enough for two to three skeins of yarn and it opens up and there's this huge gusset at the bottom. Uh, two to three skeins of yarn. It can hold a larger shawl. It can hold a smaller sweater like a child or a baby sweater. You can knit toys in here. You can do socks and have plenty of room. You could put multiple pairs of socks in here if you want to just bring them all with you. Um, toys, baby sweaters, smaller blankets, smaller adult sweaters before they get too far. Uh, just tons of stuff. They're very useful. I tend to consider these a very um, all-purpose, one-size-fits-all kind of a bag. I love this. This is, a, I think, a 2012 Halloween print from Cosmo Fabrics that I really loved. Uh, and then I've been pairing it with this herringbone denim that has this really fun textural element that I think works well with Halloween. Um, and yeah, there are going to be a couple of these, and then there's a very subtle polka dot in there. And I will be uh, photographing these today and uploading them into the shop in preview mode. I did another one of a kind. This one's a slightly different size and shape. Um, a lot of this update is going to be, I'm calling them misfit bags. Um, sometimes when I'm distracted, I cut things out the wrong size. Uh, sometimes I try to do odd things with fat quarters to make them work for project bags. And these are all, so like this one's slightly smaller than the previous bag. It's a little bit more square than rectangular. Um, again, a really fun print. It's these little cats from a Japanese company called Koka. Uh, a little bit more masculine maybe than the other one if you uh, don't want something quite so girly with pink more polka dots on the inside. Um, and so these are all gonna be different sizes and shapes than what I normally make for the most part. So here are some of the 
the odd shaped ones. Like there's this fun print. I got a smaller, longer bag here, which these all could hold socks easily. Uh, or again, something smaller, like a toy. They're just not as tall. And then like I've got this print, which was a really fun fat quarter. And then what did I put in here? Most of my linings are almost always neutral. I like to keep linings lighter and kind of gray usually. And then I'm doing a new size of my normal style of bag that I'm calling, I think I'm gonna call it a mini project bag. This thing is tiny and wee and I think it is so adorable. So I'm taking my normal style of how I put together my regular size small bag and making a mini, which can you see how tiny that is? It's adorable. I have already opened this up and tested it out. It will easily hold a full skein of sock yarn plus a sock project either off to the side or on the top with room to spare. Now the, pl the tag placement on this one particular one is not great because I didn't think about that. Uh, but the future ones will have the tags up here and I'm hoping to have one to two more of these before I upload tomorrow night. I'm going to do a little bit more sewing later today. But this is a new mini size bag. I use this heavyweight denim on the bottom and I line all the upper bags in fleece to try to even them out weight wise. And they are a really good solid bag. And then this one has a little bit of this polka dot in there and it's gray. So you're gonna be able to see stuff like this. And I think from here on out, I'll probably be doing some more bags, but I'm hoping after the temperatures drop, after this heat wave ends in a couple of days, I'm hoping to finally get to dyeing some more yarn. I have a lot of uh, the bulky weight singles yarn in my stash, my, my shop stash that I think I'm going to dye up for the next update after this. Um, I've got a bunch of different bases. I want to do some more of those larger shawl size skeins. Um, and I have plenty of regular fingering sock weight yarns to do too. But I wanted to, um, I guess, focus on bags this time because it didn't involve having to be out in my ridiculously hot and humid and gross garage speckling. So I think that's it. Yes, I think that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining me today and taking a little bit of your time to catch up with me. Um, I always love having you all here and I love hearing back from you. So if you can comment, um, if you're on YouTube, comments and likes always help me out. Shares help me out um, because I update infrequently. If you would like to hit the notification bell, which should be down there somewhere, uh, it will alert you when I update my podcast so that you don't have to go searching for me or digging through your subscriptions if you have a ton of them. Um, those would all be appreciated as well as please do that for any other small podcasters who you watch who might need a little bit of help. Uh, fighting against the bigger podcasts in the YouTube algorithm system. Uh, it's very hard for us to get noticed unless people specifically know to look for us. Uh, so if you think somebody would enjoy this podcast, by all means, please share it. Um, I always try to answer back as quickly as I can. Uh, if you guys talk to me, I don't see I don't see notifications that I have comments unless I'm on my computer though so I tend to try to do that at least once a week so I might be a little slow re-commenting back to you there but if you come into the Ravelry thread I will answer you pretty quickly I usually log on to Ravelry once a day uh, or you can comment on my blog which this will also be on there and I will engage with you there so yeah I think that's it guys Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope wherever you are that your weather is to your liking. Mine is not today, but that'll change in about two days and it'll be glorious and chilly and fall like here. I think maybe I'll close out this podcast sharing some pictures from a walk I took with my husband and my children yesterday. We went out and took a couple long walks and we're enjoying the starts of the fall foliage change up here. We're always a couple weeks ahead of what's happening way downstate in Rhinebeck. Um, so I'm hoping that by the time the Sheep and Wool Festival happens this year, that the foliage will be great down there. Oh, that's another thing. I'm actually going to Rhinebeck this year. Uh, so if you happen to see me, say hi to me. I'm a bit shy and a little jumpy in the wild, but I will calm down and warm up. It's just, it takes me a minute <laughs> because you have me at a bit of a disadvantage. Usually you know me, but I may not always know you. Uh, but if you happen to be at the Sheep and Wool Festival and you see me, say hi. I always like hearing from people. So I think that's it. I will talk to you all later. Hopefully it'll be a little less than a month. And maybe I'll do a recap. I don't think I'm going to do a Rhinebeck recap. Um, I don't know how people feel about that. But I personally do not like watching three dozen separate Rhinebeck or other big wool festival recaps at the end of everybody going. 
This might be the curmudgeon in me talking, but I don't like seeing everybody name drop constantly and talk about all the things they did and then all the things that they bought. Uh, I do, I don't mind if people mention it and I don't mind if, you know, if they talk about something that they thought was cool or interesting about the festival, but having to hear the laundry list of all the people they hung out with and all the things they did and then everybody's talking about the exact same things, I kind of feel like it's not necessary. Of course, everybody can do whatever they want in their own podcast, but I tend to skip Fiber Festival recaps on the different podcasts that I watch unless I think I'm going to see something more interesting. So I probably will not do a Rhinebeck recap. Um, I will be going to the Jill Draper open house as well if you happen to be going to that the Friday night before Rhinebeck in Kingston, New York. Um, I will be there. Well, that's a plan anyway, probably early because it, if I'm going to go in, I'm hoping to buy something in <laughs> get away from there. But I will be staying, I think, in Woodstock, New York is where the the Airbnb I'm staying at is. So again, if you see me, say hi to me and uh, I will talk to you guys soon. And until we talk again, please be your very best selves and do good things. Bye kittens.